my name's uh, Jim Wu. I am at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. I'd um, like to welcome all of you tonight to the Society of Skeletal Radiology a Resident Educational Club webinar. Um, uh, I am excited to be serving as the moderator for this session tonight. And tonight uh, we're going to be learning how to deal with those uh, pesky uh, incidental bone lesions. Uh, I'd first like to remind everybody to sign up for Poll Everywhere. There's a couple of slides showing you how to do that. There's also going to be a QR code in the talk, and I'd highly recommend you to kind of log in with your phone. And this is a great way to play along um, with the uh, with with the, uh, the the talk and 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 what what we have planned for tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker for tonight. It's uh, Dr. David Gamark. Uh, he's a assistant professor of radiology in the Division of Musculoskeletal Imaging and Intervention at the University of Colorado. He's also the Diagnostic Radiology Residency Program Director and the Assistant MSK Fellowship Director. Uh, Dr. Kamark's interests are in MSK uh, intervention and also in novel uh, teaching methods. And I'm excited to, uh, to hear his talk and for us to kind of learn about how to deal with uh, how to, and manage these incidental uh, bone lesions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction there, Jim. I am going to share my screen here. Hopefully we get the right one. All right. I hope everybody is seeing what I think you're seeing now. So perfect. Uh, so we're, yeah, we're going to talk today about the uh, management of these incidental bone lesions. Um, I'm David Gamar from Colorado. Thanks so much for having me. Let me. Perfect. I have no disclosures. So today's objective, so we're going to talk about a lot of these commonly encountered incidental bone lesions, um, and we're going to do this kind of through the through the algorithms that are presented to us in the SSR white paper, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, we're going to practice kind of placing these lesions into different categories, kind of based on their non-aggressive, their indeterminate, or their aggressive features, and then based on that categorization, try and be able to suggest the next steps in, in management. Um, one of my caveats for today is there's going to be a lot of diagnoses we're going to go through. I think one of the differences between today's RAC is that I'm going to show a bunch of different cases and different diagnoses, and most of this is to kind of illustrate how to go through this algorithm. I'm not necessarily wanting to go into any specific diagnosis in too much particular detail today. So as has been mentioned a few times, we're going to use Poll Everywhere. Um, and so here's a QR code. If you scan it, it should take it to my uh, to my screen. Um, if you you probably hopefully see right now that there's no active polls, but there will be some. Um, this uh, URL will work, or you can text as well. And if, if you accidentally close the page or whatnot, um, either this, this address will pop up on, on each of the slides. So, so we're, we're doing this um, kind of through the guise of a, of a standardized imaging workup, right? The idea that um, you can go through any sort of workup of any sort of modality, of any sort of subject, and kind of get to the same result. Um, and so I think the gold standard that we like to think about with this is the BIRATS categorization, right? So we're used when our mammal rotations to putting things into BIRATS 0 through BIRATS 6. And it doesn't matter what training program you go to, what breast center you go to, um, you're, you're going to learn this in the same way and you're going to go about it the same way. And this is a very validated method where there's very, um, very specific percentages and likelihoods of, of malignancy. And so obviously the management is based on that. And kind of the thing I really like about BIRADS in particular is that there's really good buy-in from the part of the oncologists, the surgeons, um, the PCPs from everybody. Um, and so obviously in the last couple of, of years, we've seen a lot of kind of alphabet RADS come about, right? LIRADS was the first one and, and, and following that. And, and so what we're going to talk about today is kind of MSK's version of this, which doesn't necessarily quite have the standardization um, that we see in some of this, but I think is a really good way to go about troubleshooting these lesions. Um, and, and we're at the point now where we're trying to get some buy-in from some of those, um, our colleagues that we work with. So today is being, uh, being, focused on the incidental lesion, right? So this is a lesion that we detect by chance during an exam that we perform for a different or an unrelated reason, right? So uh, when you think about all of the exams that you do in other sections, um, one of the consistent things really about all of them is, is bones are present on almost all of them, right? Even mammograms, you're going to get a couple couple bones every now and then. So um, there's, a, there's a, a good chance that you may run across a lesion um, that you didn't necessarily um, that you didn't necessarily expect. And so this is kind of a good way to go about um, working through those lesions. So where do we see these lesions on? Well, sometimes they're on studies that you're reading for a different indication. Um, sometimes they're on studies that you look at when you're reading a study that we wouldn't necessarily do in the MSK world, but obviously there's lots of bones there too. Um, sometimes it's a study from a different uh, physical location. So this is the old hospital transfer from St. Elsewhere. 
Uh, or sometimes this is a call from a colleague, a non-radiologist who says, hey, I, I saw this lesion. I wanted to know what you thought about it. Um, and so when I think about how I put these lesions together, this is just kind of a graph I made up. And the idea being that you have, uh, you've got good lesions. And so up here in the blue, we see these lesions that I consider to be good, and they tend to have imaging features of goodness, right? Don't ask me what the the, the, the quantitative value is there. Uh, but but features that we know to be good, and there's features that we we know to be bad. And I, I think that most of the cases we see tend to be to be good cases, and they tend to have good features, and bad cases tend to have bad features, but there's this crossover in the middle. And so what we're trying to do with this sort of categorization is to place these lesions um, into categories where we can kind of define, we know that these lesions that are good are going to be essentially 100% specific of, of being a, a good diagnosis. And the same thing can be said about some of those bad features. And those ones in the middle, we know we're going to have to tease out a little bit. And so we'll get into these bone rads categories soon. Um, but the idea that, that, that we can put them into these categories that each have different forms of management based on if we think it's an aggressive or a non-aggressive lesion. And so that causes us to put things into these buckets, right? And so we put things into a benign etiology, which means to, to either let it be because it's benign, or it can still be benign, yet uh, still need to be addressed um, for other reasons, such as stability, for pain, for cosmesis, et cetera. There's certain lesions out there that, that we can put into this malignant bucket and say we need to raise the appropriate red flag of, of concern, recommend various forms of consultation, um, and then make sure that we address anything urgent, such as an impending pathologic fracture, cord compression, things like that. And then we end up with this one in the middle, which is, I think, where we spend a lot of time and, and frustration of this is indeterminate. And so the question then is, so what do we need to do to confidently and reasonably figure it out? Um, you can have, you know, obviously an interval follow-up where you, you see how it changes. You can go in and, and directly sample it um, to get a histologic diagnosis. Um, or of course, you can you can go get uh, different types of imaging studies with the hopes of being able to move from one of these indeterminate categories into either being benign or, or malignant. So a lot of this today is going to be based on the 2021 um, SSR white paper. So this was a committee that was commissioned by the SSR, led by our own Dr. Wu today, who seems to be in a great position to be able to help us talk about it. Um, uh, a committee put together to, to kind of come up with, with what these algorithms were um, in terms of how to manage these um, in a way that, that SSR, so being the organization that, that takes care of all things musculoskeletal imaging, um, can kind of stand behind as one. And this was presented at the 2021 meeting um, and then uh, produced into a manuscript um, about a year later, so about a year ago. And so that this lesion specifically talks about solitary bone lesions. So what happens if you have a, a diagnosis with multiple lesions out there? Well, then we all know that that generally confers that you probably have a higher chance of metastatic disease, of multiple myeloma, or maybe some sort of systemic issue. So think about things like skeletal dysplasias or, or multifocal fibrous dysplasia, for example. So a lot of today is going to focus on solitary lesions. And one more thing, uh, today's going to focus on, on adults. So I think back to the medical school where a lot of my pediatric attendings would say things like, you know, kids aren't just little adults, right? They have their own disease processes, their own pathophysiology, things like that. Um, and so it's, I think, important uh, uh, that we consider that, that they have their own way of doing things. And I'm, I'm not a pediatric radiologist. And so um, this algorithm is gonna, going to, to involve adults. All right. Uh, so radiographs. Radiographs are not necessarily specifically addressed as part of this newly proposed algorithm. And the reason for that is that the description that we use for these lesions, and this is when we talk about things like margin and matrix and location, periostitis, et cetera, is pretty well documented. And the management that comes from that in terms of radiographic findings being considered aggressive or non-aggressive, that's pretty well documented as well. So a lot of these radiographic lesions I think of as being an ant mini. Uh, so um, uh, a lesion that you you know what it is the moment you look at it. Um, and so, you know, sometimes that means they're benign or they're just blatantly bad. Um, sometimes these lesions are obvious within the patient's clinical context. So if you know the patient has metastatic disease and they have a bunch of lucent lesions, then certainly that can confer a, a disease, a metastatic disease, for example. Um, and then they're nonspecific. And so that radiograph is going to prompt a more specific uh, dedicated workup, which brings us to the non-incidental lesions. And what I mean by that is you are asked to work up a lesion. So you're getting a femur MRI to work up a femur lesion and it's being specifically performed for that reason. If that's the case, then I urge you to make sure you protocol it in a way that you can get all of the information imaging wise from that study. So we should we don't wanna be reading that study later and saying, oh, I wish I had this sequence that would have helped answer this. So making sure the field of view is right, 
comparisons are present. Did we give IV contrast? And then did there are any other sequences we could have needed? And that's all I'm going to say about the non-incidental lesions. So this brings us to our own RADs, so bone RADs. So this is that new reporting and data system that was proposed in the SSR 2021 paper. Um, this was uh, the initial application of this is that workup again of a solitary lesion in an adult. And you can see that there's four categories that, that we have now. So a bone rad's one, a benign lesion with the recommendation being leave it alone. And the thing that I want to kind of point out here is that I think a lot of this was driven on recommendations. And so a bone rad's two, which is more similar to like the birad zero, which says that it's incompletely assessed and, and we need some sort of further imaging to be able to, to evaluate that further. Bone rads three being an indeterminate etiology. And in, I think in earlier versions of this, there was like a 3A, a 3B, and a 3C. And each of those conferred a slightly different frequency of follow-up. And that has since been condensed into this single version where we follow up the lesion in 6, 12, and, and 24 months. Um, and then finally, a bone rads four. And I do want to point out that bone rads four doesn't necessarily imply that it's a malignant lesion. It can also be a lesion that, that may be not malignant, but still needs treatment. Um, and so again, trying to use management to help drive the categorization. Um, so a referral to orthopedic oncology, need for a biopsy, et cetera, things like that. So the algorithms that are presented in this paper, um, there's four of them in total. So there's two for CT and two for MRI. So the initial decision tree from this comes from asking if the lesion was discovered, discovered, discovered incidentally on CT or on MRI. Um, and then on the CT1, being able to break this into solitary lucent lesions or solitary uh, sclerotic and mixed density lesions. Um, an MRI asking uh, initially about the T1 signal characterization, either being high T1 or low T1, each of those different categories having its own algorithm to work its way through. Some of the information you may need for the management of this um, are things like demographics, so the patient's age, maybe their gender, um, what symptoms. Um, and so the main symptom that we're going to talk about here is pain, and it specifically specifies pain that's presumed to be due to that lesion, so in the right location of the lesion, things like that. Um, other parts of their past medical history, so history of prior malignancy, specifically perhaps a malignancy with high risk of, of bone metastases, and then other sorts of lab biomarkers, such as the PSA in a patient with suspected prostate cancer, things like that. Um, obviously, if you don't know this, that's a good opportunity to go into the chart, and if you don't have access to that or, or need more information, it's a really good opportunity to reach out to some of your colleagues um, to try and kind of help piece this together. So we will jump into this now. We'll start here with our CT lesions. Um, I don't know if anyone, all of you have ever seen a CT with the cover off, but uh, this is kind of what it looks like. So next time you're sticking your head in here to do a biopsy or an injection, uh, just something to think about. So we'll start with the solitary lucent lesion. And I, I didn't use the word lytic, right? Lucent and lytic, sometimes we, we, we uh, uh, mean them to say, say them to mean the same thing, but I, I view lytic as being a much more aggressive way to say um, what I think lucent is, um, which is that it has a lower attenuation than normal trabecular bone. So here in the sacrum, we see this lucent lesion that transversely crosses the sacrum. Uh, I put an ROI on it that's probably really small on your screen, but it's about 20 Hounsfield units. I put this ROI on, ROI on normal trabecular bone, ends up being about 115, so certainly lower than that. These are those hypodense lesions. And the paper, we don't necessarily describe this as having very discrete um, Hounsfield unit criteria. However, most of these lesions are going to fall between negative 100 and positive 200 Hounsfield units. So that's going to be fat density and soft, some soft tissue and fluid densities. This is juxtaposition to the solitary, sclerotic, or mixed density lesions. And so the, the official definition that's given for this is any lesion that doesn't meet our definition of a lucent lesion. Um, and so for sclerotic lesions, we tend to say that those are lesions with higher density than adjacent trabecula. I will admit that this is not a solitary lesion, but I kind of liked this picture because it gives us multiple different densities. We've got this very dense um, rounded focus, a slightly lesser dense focus here, and then kind of a very hazy sclerotic area up here. However, these all meet that definition of, of a sclerotic lesion. Um, mixed lesions tend to refer to about a 50-50 or one-to-one -one ratio um, of both lucent and uh, sclerotic components. Um, so the example of that here with these kind of centrally lucent and more peripherally sclerotic lesions. Um, if you have a lesion that's much more lucent or much more sclerotic, certainly not anywhere near 50-50, those tend to kind of fall into the solitary lucent or sclerotic categories. So this all is going to bring us to our first case. Uh, so jump on. Oh, we may have some questions here already. 
So this is a 65 year old female with severe hip pain. What's your initial impression? So I'm sure everybody here hopefully now has found it. I tried to give you the whole pelvis CT um, so that you could see the abnormality on the left side and maybe the normal appearance of the proximal femur on the right with that superimposed um, loosened component on that sagittal view. We'll give another couple seconds here. I think many of you have, have identified that this really doesn't look too good. So we'll do this with our next case. I'll bring up the poll here in just a second. Um, so this is a 61-year-old male, lower extremity runoff for claudication. Um, if you have found it, the lesion's down there. So we'll blow it up and put it in a question now. So how about this? 61-year-old male, lower extremity runoff. How do you think about this one? Excellent. Lots of smart people out there today. Perfect. So this brings us to our first branching point, which is aggressive features. And so here's the lucent top of the lucent algorithm here and top of the sclerotic or mixed density lesion here. And the very first branching point is going to be those aggressive features. And so a lot of these look really similar to the ones that we talk about on radiographs, right? So pain at the side of the location, cortical involvement. So either thinning or scalloping of the cortex. And I tend to think of that more aggressively in terms of being greater than 50% of the diameter of the cortex. Um, I mean, sometimes it's, it's so much so that the cortex is absent or eroded at that point. Uh, soft tissue extension, pathologic fracture. And so the thing about this is if you have one of these lesions and you deem that it does have aggressive features, any of them, um, then it becomes this bone rats four, uh, which obviously means to go and seek attention. So conclusion, if it looks aggressive, speak no more. Let's call it aggressive. Let's call it a bone rats four and have it managed appropriately. Um, so going back to these two cases, right? So this first case, we see this lucent lesion. We see areas of, of pretty substantial cortical thinning, even maybe some cortical absence and a little periostitis over here. Um, so this ended up being a case of metastatic thyroid cancer. And then many of you probably very astutely recognize this as almost the ant mini appearance um, that we associate with a calcaneal interosseous lipoma, which tends to have that lower density, um, however, doesn't have any of those really aggressive features that we would be worried about. And so this is when I think that, that we would be very comfortable calling a benign bone rads one lesion. Um, consistent with this known diagnosis. So that brings us to our next point. So we've said that there's no overtly aggressive features. So the next question we have to answer is, does the patient have a history of malignancy with a propensity for osseous metastatic disease? And so this brings us to our next question of what types of, oh, I didn't clear this text, darn it. All right, that's okay. What, times of, what types of malignancy have a high propensity for osseous metastatic disease? So feel free to throw in there's some good ones there. Excellent. Excellent. I love it. Perfect. So yes, these are the ones I tend to think of and whoever threw on thyroid there too, I will grant you that that's not on this list, but that's an appropriate one as well. So these are the ones I tend to think of that we see most frequently and certainly the one I just showed you. Um, so if they have a history of malignancy, however, the lesion doesn't appear aggressive, then that's when we consider this to go into this indeterminate category. And indeterminate allows us, to, it actually gives us two possible recommendations. One of them is calling this a bone rads two, which again means that we probably should get some sort of other imaging to evaluate this. So uh, we, can, we can get a PET to look for other lesions around the body, or we can maybe get a dedicated MRI with and without um, to be able to, to kind of further evaluate the morphology using signal characteristics and whatnot. The other option being to, to call this a bone rats three, which is where we follow this up in six, 12, and, and 24 months to confirm stability. I think if you were to give an oncologist these two choices, you'd probably be ordering a lot of PET scans. Um, so I think this is a really important time um, to have that conversation with, with maybe some of your oncology colleagues um, to find a way to work this up. And obviously, as you read more and more of these, you may feel more comfortable putting certain of these in, in different buckets. So let's say we've we've said that a lesion doesn't have um, it doesn't it doesn't have overtly aggressive features. The patient doesn't have a, a, a personal history of met, a metastatic disease or, or or a malignancy with a high propensity of metastatic disease. So our next branching point is going to be intralesional fat. And the nice thing is intralesional fat lesions um, in in lucent lesions are almost always benign. And so they tend to if we say yes to this, they go down into this uh, category that's a bone rads one intraosseous lipoma. Um, and and uh, that's kind of the end of that round. But what happens if it doesn't have intralesional fat? 
Um, and so this brings us to a question that we're going to see a couple of times in this algorithm, where it asks us if this lesion is entirely consistent with a known benign etiology. And this is where I wanted to say at the beginning of the lecture, we may throw out a couple of these diagnoses, and I'm not wanting to focus on them too much other than to say that answering this question yes or no means that you need to be familiar enough with these lesions um, to, to be able to say, yes, it looks like that, let's move on or not. So if it's entirely consistent with one of these known benign lesions, then we call it a bone rads one and, and we move on. Um, but what happens if it's not consistent with one of these, I call them, you know, the do not touch lesions, right? Then we have to ask ourselves: is it consistent with a malignant lesion or a lesion that requires treatment? So that's going to get us here to our next case. This is case number two, a 16-year-old male getting a full or extremity CTA for a gunshot wound. How would you characterize this lesion? Take this opportunity to get a drink. Perfect. So everyone's saying A and B, and I'm glad that there are people saying both of these. Um, so is it consistent with this known lesion? The way in which we differentiate this is to, um, is to, to decide if we believe it's cortically based or medullary based. And you can see the number of diagnoses that it, um, that it puts under both cortically based lesions and medullary lesions. And if you answer yes to any of these, then it goes to a bone rads four. And again, that's not necessarily because we know all of these to be malignant, but because they probably need to be addressed by some sort. And there are probably some of you who answered A on that last question. You went, well, wait a second. We just said that it looks benign. And so probably many of you recognize this cortically based lesion with this known central lucency or this lucency in central sclerotic nidus that's consistent with an osteoidosteoma. Um, this is given a bone rats four. And what that means by it is that it really should be evaluated for treatment. You know, traditionally, we had thought of these as, as being resected or maybe undergoing an ablation. But we know now that there's actually a growing body of evidence that, that if for the ones that are less symptomatic, um, that maybe the watch and wait approach is, is more appropriate as a lot of these tend to resolve. But I think it's important in that case that they're still evaluated by, by somebody who can kind of help walk them through that so that if they needed to have um, a more definitive treatment, um, that, that that would be available to them. So I think both A and B were correct on that one. So when we look at the CT sclerotic and mixed density lesion, the first top of the table, the first top part of the table looks almost identical, right? We talk about aggressive features. We talk about a history of metastatic disease. We look for intralesional fat. Um, but then this is where the sclerotic and mixed density lesion algorithm branches a little bit. And our next step here is describing the matrix. Um, and so let's go to our next question. There we go. So 44-year-old male, CTA chest to rule out an aortic dissection, which of course every 44-year-old male that walks into an ER certainly has. Um, which abnormality, can you click on the abnormality? People are starting to jump on it, excellent. Beautiful. Got a lost one in the vertebral body there, that's all right. So we'll go to our next question. Uh, so this is related to that. So that same person, um, what do you think about it? Excellent. Got a couple who'd like to see a little bit more imaging. Some people want to go scoop it out surgically, maybe. All right. Oh, making up some ground here. All right. So we've got a couple who aren't so sure and a couple who think it's very benign. So many of you may have recognized this as fibrous dysplasia through this typical ground glass matrix. And so I think of ground glass as kind of being like the lab equipment, what they use for, for a lot of the services on lab equipment. There's always the, the picture of all the, the crushed up pieces of glass. Um, fibrous dysplasia, of course, can have kind of a variable appearance, right? It can have some cystic components, some more solid components, but the ground glass is kind of the, the ant mini appearance to it. It can be kind of expansile as it was in this case. Uh, we've seen it in both monoostotic and polyostotic forms. And then there's that highly core testable syndromic association with things like Mazabrod syndrome, McCune Albright. Um, we shouldn't really see this change too much after skeletal maturity. So fibrous dysplasia um, is part of the matrix characterization on the algorithm um, goes to a bone rads one. We call it fibrous dysplasia and we move on. I will grant you that there are places that we can see fibrous dysplasia, like in the skull and whatnot, that sometimes will require certain forms of therapy um, or certain things to be addressed. Um, so I think in that case, maybe it's a little specific as to where it is. All right, next case, case four, 44 female incidental femur lesion. What kind of matrix are we seeing here? Excellent. 
Excellent. And now we're just changing sizes depending on people like the word chondroid or the cartilage better. Perfect. <laughs> Very nice with the asterisk. Rings and arcs, I love it. Great. So very much so this is chondroid matrix, right? And so this is implying a cartilage lesion. I always remember back to when I was a, a first year resident and we were learning about matrix um, mineralization and uh, um, you know, people would describe osteoid matrix, oh, it's the fluffy cloud appearance. And chondroid matrix was always described as ring and arcs, and everybody would kind of scratch their, you know, scratch their nose a little bit. I, what are you talking about, rings and arcs? And so it, yeah, it is tough to describe, right? We think of kind of these amorphous, rounded uh, shapes that are kind of put together. I mean, the, the answer I think I got initially, which was unsatisfying at the time, was you'll know it when you see it. You know, you'll, you'll see a lot of it and start to, to kind of get an idea of it. But when we look at it in the, in the context of these lesions, the next branching point of if we see chondroid matrix is asking, um, are there concerning features to this cartilage lesion? And so the concerning features, um, again, kind of like we've seen with a lot of our other lesions being endosteal scalloping, expanse hour remodeling, cortical breakthrough, periostitis, et cetera. However, one of the things that really helps us to distinguish this, as you probably heard, is that cartilage lesions shouldn't necessarily be painful. And when they are painful, that tends to be one of those um, clues that maybe tips us off that this is undergoing a malignant degeneration or that it's a more, a more high-grade lesion. Additionally, the algorithm differentiates between cartilage lesions based on size. And so lesions that are less than five centimeters are considered to be benign and therefore are, are, are called a bone lads one, assuming they don't have any of these features. And then a lesion greater than five centimeters um, can have a higher propensity to degeneration and malignancy. And so we call that a bone rads three so that we can follow it up. And so certainly here's a lesion that's um, bigger than that five centimeter mark. And here's some smaller ones that if you read enough knee MRIs, you'll start seeing those little distal femur cartilage lesions all over the place. So, and a quick note on cartilage lesions and the axial skeleton. Um, we know through a lot of these um, kind of epidemi epidemiological studies that have been done that enchondromas are very rare in the spine, sternum, pelvis, and ribs. And so that's why if you try and call a cartilage lesion in the pelvis, you tend to perk up the ears of orthopedic oncologists and radiologists who, who know that that's a pretty rare phenomenon and, and these should be treated with a much higher level of suspicion as if they were a chondrosarcoma. Um, all right, our next case here, 78 year old male CT abdomen pelvis for abdominal pain. How would you characterize this lesion? All right. So a lot of people think it looks pretty good, and we've got some who want to see some more and some who don't like what they see. So we'll talk about it a little more here. So hopefully you've recognized this as a bone island or anostosis. We see them all the time. This is one of the few diagnoses in radiology where speculated margins are a good thing or where that's an acceptable part of this. Um, this really sclerotic appearance or that dark T1 and T2 signal and MRI um, there was a good study that was put out a couple of years back that showed that if the mean attenuation is greater than the 885 Hounsfield units, max attenuation greater than 1060 Hounsfield units, that carries about a 95% sensitivity, 96% specificity in distinguishing this as a bone island as opposed to an osteoblastic met. So in this case, we put this marker on it, it measured at 1170 Hounsfield units, so we can pretty confidently say that this is a bone island um, as opposed to an osteoblastic met. All right, moving on to some MRI fun here. So MRI characterization starts with the analysis of what the T1 signal of the lesion is. So what happens if you're at some weird protocol and you don't have a T1 sequence? Well, that's probably a good situation where the patient should come back and at minimum get that T1 sequence since that's the first branch point that we run into here um, to be able to really use this, this algorithm to its full advantage. Otherwise, we put this into... Um, hyper-intense to hypo-intense categorization. So for example, this lesion that we see in the proximal tibia here, certainly much higher signal intensity than in that adjacent musculature or in the spine and intervertebral disc. So certainly a hyper-intense lesion. We see this lesion here in the superior acetabulum, which is relatively similar in, in intensity to the adjacent skeletal muscle. So this would be more of an iso-intense lesion, which for a lot of these algorithms, the iso-intense and hypo-intense are, are grouped together. And then certainly this lesion being quite dark uh, comparison to the adjacent intervertebral discs, so certainly a hypo-intense lesion. So what's your differential diagnosis for low T1 signal that you see just on its own? Um, and so this is kind of what I think of, right? So we think of initially things like marrow replacement, and that's 
That's kind of the catchphrase we use for tumor invasion of marrow or infection, so pus um, going into where uh, the marrow should be. Um, it can be other things though as well, right? So sclerosis, we can see fibrotic changes of the marrow. There can be varying degrees of red marrow reconversion or marrow dysplasias, which can have a malignant component to them as well. And then don't only, don't forget that that fluid can, can have that T1 hypointense signal as well. So then that brings us to the next point in this hypointense or low T1 algorithm, which is the T2 signal characterization. So this is pretty simple of high T2 and low T2 signal. So that brings us to our next case. This is a 17-year-old male, uh, knee pain after sliding into second base. During a baseball game, how would you characterize this lesion? All right, we seem pretty unanimous as a group that this is this is not a good lesion. Maybe someone doesn't think it looks too bad, but perfect. We'll come back to this here in just a second. So we are going down this pathway now of having a low T1 lesion, but a high T2 signal within it. And so the very first point of this here is going to be similar to kind of where we've been in a couple of these other algorithms, which is aggressive imaging features are still bad and therefore immediately go to a bone rats for, for more definitive management and, and treatment. Um, there are some parts that are listed here in this first algorithm that ask you to, to put in some of that clinical context that we talked about. So is there a path fracture? If this is a patient uh, with, with concern for prostate meds, do they have a high PSA? Is there pain associated with it? Things like that. Um, or is there that history again of malignancy with high propensity for, for bone meds? And so going back to this case, we certainly see that dark T1 signal with that bright T2 signal. And I think many of you immediately recognize these very aggressive features, this large soft tissue component, these striations that we tend to think of with that periostitis. I mean, you can almost imagine what the radiograph looks like. And certainly this is an osteosarcoma. I'm sure many of you recognize that. Um, so that's why it gets such, a, such an aggressive categorization. All right, next case here. Case seven, 78-year-old female with chronic hip pain. What do you think about this lesion? Excellent. We got a good, confident group today. I've got a couple people that would like to see some more imaging. Excellent. So this is down, down, down that T1 dark, but T2 bright pathway. And so once we get beyond um, that last categorization, categorization that we talked about, the next question is going to again be, is it entirely consistent um, with, one of, with one of these etiologies um, that we know to be benign? And so in this case, I showed you this T2 bright lesion with this little neck um, going, to the, going to the hip. I didn't necessarily show you that the patient had some background osteoarthritis. Um, and so in this typical kind of peripheral enhancement that we know to be a subchondral cyst or a geode in the setting of, of hip OA. Um, I think that neck really kind of helps to seal the deal. So in this case, we know it's a benign thing because it falls into one of these categories and therefore we give it that bone rads one. Um, I think uh, so if you don't have one of these things that's that's consistent um, with a benign etiology, then it again goes to that bone rads two or bone rads three saying we need a little bit more imaging or it's probably appropriate to follow this up. Um, this is one in our practice, in my practice that I think actually comes up every now and then we have a, a lesion that kind of looks like a subchondral cyst, but the patient again has some history that that's a little bit concerning. Um, and that's when we tend to maybe follow these up. And I think we've even biopsied a few as well. I think there's a great point that's made here as the end of the algorithm that goes with a lot of what we've talked about already, um, which is I think radiographic correlation. So getting radiographs um, is always a good thing if you think it would really help you to force one way or the other. So um, I think one of the good examples of this is cartilage lesions. I've certainly worked with a number of people who don't necessarily feel comfortable calling cartilage lesions without having seen a radiograph where they can see that cartilage matrix um, in there. And of course, if you see that, then you feel really good that that's, that's what it is. And if it's small and non-aggressive and, and whatnot, um, then, then that's an appropriate one. So radiographs are always, I think, good to kind of help just have that final confirmation if needed. All right, next case. 33-year-old female had a skiing injury. How would you characterize this lesion? Fortunately, I don't think had an ACL tear, no meniscal tear. It's almost the end of the season. All right. Most of you think it looks pretty good. A couple of people would like to see a little bit more. And I think maybe this is an example where showing you a radiograph um, wouldn't be a horrible thing to bring this home if you were really unsure about it. However, I think we can probably probably do pretty well with the diagnosis on this. 
Um, and so this is an example of a non-ossifying fibroma in a skeletally mature patient who's, um, who this is essentially healed, but kind of left this cortical scar, so to speak. So it's got that very low T1 signal, low T2 signal. It's in that classic cortically based location. Um, so here in the algorithm, we're in the low T2 signal category. Um, we're being asked again, are there any kind of aggressive features that we would see with this? And it calls out the presence of a halo sign, which we'll talk about shortly. Is there a solid mass enhancement? Is it in the sternum in a patient with breast cancer? And so if the answer is yes to any of these, then that's one of those immediate things that elevates that to a bone rats four. If we say no, then we ask ourselves if there's that history of malignancy. And again, if there is, then it goes into the indeterminate category. And if not, then we can consider one of these benign etiologies, as in this case, an NOF. You know, sometimes I've heard these called ossified NOFs, which I understand is an oxymoron, but that's what we call them. Just for comparison, this is an example of a skeletally immature patient who still has kind of this active NOF. So it's kind of T1 intermediate signal to adjacent skeletal muscle, T2 hyper intense, um, but it's in that classical cortically based lesions. I'm sure you've seen many of these both on radiographs. Um, and, and they can kind of look a little ugly at times or look a little big, um, but we, we know that these are don't touch lesions. They tend to resolve on their own. So certainly a, a, a bone rads one. And the halo sign. So this is speaking to lesions that are both T1 and T2 hypointense. However, on the T2 imaging, they have this thin peripheral um, rim of, of uh, edema around it. And so this has been shown um, in Dr. Schweitzer's paper to have about a 99% specificity for a metastatic lesion. And so this is one of those things that it obviously calls out in bullet point number one in the algorithm to say these halo signs, even though they're T1 and T2 dark, are very suspicious for metastatic disease. So this leads us to our final algorithm, which is high T1 signal intensity lesions. And I put this last because I think this algorithm is one of the easier ones to get your head around, even though it, it's still an algorithm with lots of boxes and arrows and things like that. So what's your differential diagnosis for high T1 lesions? Well, fat's the easy one, right? So it can be normal marrow fat. It can be kind of geographic lesional fat, like a lipoma, or we can think of other sorts of kind of heterogeneous fatty elements. Um, you know, proteinaceous fluid, remember, can be high, um, high T1 signal as well. And then hemorrhaged, based on where it is in its maturation process, can have that as well. I threw in these two at the bottom because I think it's important that you just have these in mind, right? So melanoma mets related to either the hemorrhage or the melanin content can be high T1 in signal. And then hemorrhagic mets as well can have that. Um, and so most of what we see on here is, is relatively benign, but I just keep those two in mind at the bottom. So, all right. Case number nine, 61-year-old female. She had lower lumbar decompressive surgery. This is another follow-up. Um, what do you think about the lesion? And I'll help you out by saying, if you look at the L2 vertebral body, that's where the lesion is. It's kind of along that posterior superior margin of the vertebral body. I don't know if you can see it. All right. Excellent. Looks good. I think because the word's big, a lot of you are all thinking the same thing, which is great. Right. So very correctly identified this as a benign intraosseous hemangioma. And certainly if you read a fair amount of spine MR, spine CT, or even you know CT admin and pelvis, you're going to see this all over the place. And you're, you're probably very used to seeing that typical CT appearance of those corduroy striations or those um, kind of about the spotted appearance that we see in the axial plane. And then uh, it tends to follow fat signal very well. So it's T1 hyper intense, T2 hyper intense, and then almost completely nulls on either your stir or fat saturated sequences. Um, there's two variants I just like to bring up um, because they tend to cause a little bit of trouble, right? So one is the atypical hemangioma. And this is one that, that maybe doesn't quite null on stir sequences. Um, and so it still has T1 bright signal, T2 bright signal, but it doesn't quite null all the way. And in my world, as long as it still has that fat characterization on T1 and T2 and doesn't have any overtly aggressive features, I'm still fine calling that a bone rats one. Um, the other variant here is an aggressive hemangioma. And so this is an example of that here, right? These can be quite large. They can actually be expansile and cause quite a bit of mass effect. Um, so you can see this large one here in the vertebral body, pedicle going into the lamina, poster elements, causing a fairly good degree of spinal canal stenosis. We may be able to look at this and still say, you know, I still see the striations I kind of expect in a hemangioma. I still think this is probably an aggressive hemangioma. However, this is one of those that's probably going to require some sort of more definitive management and treatment to maintain canal patency and things like that. So I think that calling this a bone rats four um, to at least get this evaluated is, is appropriate. All right, almost done here. Case number 10. 
24 year old male, spine pain, uh, had a seizure. What's your comfort level with these lesions? And I will grant you that the case, you know, today's talk is on solitary lesions. This is not a solitary lesion. I'll grant you that. But I needed a good example of it. So bear with me. Perfect. We seem to be unanimous that we don't like what we're seeing. And I don't either. So, yeah. So this is an example of metastatic melanoma with T1 hyperintensis mets. I had to dig into the literature to find one. Again, I know it's not, it, it's it's uh, mul multiple foci of disease, not solitary. However, I think it was important to throw this in just so it's something that you keep in mind. And certainly the multifocality of this, maybe if some of you picked up on the soft tissue component back here, uh, make this certainly an aggressive appearance. So this is what that high T1 lesion algorithm looks like. And so it you know, initially breaks into is this T1 signal much higher? Is it slightly higher? Um, or is there high T1 signal, but it has more of a fluid fluid component to it? What I really want to point out in all of this is that there's really only one channel that we get to bone rats for. And that's through having a T1 signal that's much higher than skeletal muscle. However, it doesn't look like sub-Q fat and it enhances in kind of a nasty way, which for this should be something like nodular or mass-like enhancement. And that's when we get to these hemorrhagic mets, melanoma mets, um, and an atypical, atypical things that need to be addressed. A lot of these other pathways lead us to a bone rads one, right? So red marrow, um, intraosseous ganglion, subchondral cysts. And then there's a couple of them that put us into the bone rads two category and ask us to get different types of imaging, which would either give us a more definitive analysis of it or push us into a different algorithm. So you can see here that some of these will go into the low T1 algorithm, for example. And again, that same caveat is mentioned there about using radiographic correlation. So we have a little bit of time. We've got like a couple minutes. Why don't we do one or two other cases here real fast, and then we'll get to some questions in just a second. All right. 38-year-old female with mid-back pain. What do you think about this? All right. Seem to be in agreement that this is bone rads 4 lesion. So we're in that low T1 category. We're in the low T2 signal. We ask ourselves if there's any concerning features. And one of them that I wanted, I, I don't know if, if those of you picked up on it, but I thought there was a little bit of a halo sign. I, I'll grant you that the whole body is, is abnormal, abnormally dark in signal, but there's a little bit of a halo sign here on that front part. Um, this ended up being a patient with metastatic lung cancer. We can see the mass in the right upper lobe. Um, and certainly if I were to show you the CT appearance of this, I think most people would be much more concerned uh, based on the periostitis and the appearance of this. You can see um, in comparison to that bone island we looked at for earlier, how this is certainly a sclerotic appearance. However, I'm not sure I'd be able to get up to that thousand Hounsfield units that we were talking about earlier. It's, it's sclerotic, but not quite that dense. So that's where that differentiation between osteoblastic mets lies. All right, we'll do another one here. This is an 80-year-old male with wrist pain after a fall. All right, got some folks that think it looks pretty good. Some people would like to see some more stuff. A radiograph would be good. I'll grant you that here. Um, and then a bone rads three. So maybe we follow this up, right? So this is our solitary lucent lesion in adults. So we'll say that it doesn't really have any aggressive features. I'll give you, it's a little thinned up here, but I'll tell you um, if you were to scroll through it, that's really kind of a, a much more isolated finding um, does it have any interlesional fat? No, but is it consistent with something that we suspect is benign in this case? Um, it's consistent with a subchondral cyst. Um, and so here's the radiograph that I'm sure we were all looking for. This is a big geode or subchondral cyst. The wrist is obviously has advanced stages of OA with a lot of TFCC, chondrocalcinosis. And a lot of times when we see these cysts in the setting of chondrocalcinosis, this is a really good sign for CPPD arthropathy. I think I have time for one more here. This is kind of a good one. So a 91-year-old female, history of a right, I don't know what an RHA, RHA is, we'll say a THA, has a hip, had a hip arthroplasty, getting this CT. Excellent. This is the one I thought was going to be a little bit more heterogeneous. So uh, we've got some people think it looks okay. Most people think that uh, it, we're not really sure and we need to follow it up. Some people want to see more. 
couple of you are willing to commit, commit them to the survey. Perfect. So here's the images that I showed you. The Hounsfield unit here measures about 22 Hounsfield units, so not quite good fluid. Certainly looks like it's got some, some scalped margins and maybe there's a little soft tissue extension. So solitary lesion, no fat density. It does have that cortical involvement. Um, and so if we're down here in the cortically based lesion, is it clearly consistent with one of these? And the answer is probably no, right? I, I don't necessarily think I would call this um, any of these. And so we went back in the patient's jacket and saw that, you know, six years ago, which wasn't even necessarily when it was put in, maybe it's just the first study we have, we still had that scalloped margin um, up here in the top. And so this actually ends up being due to acetabular osteolysis following a hip arthroplasty. And this is kind of that particle disease. You have that inflammatory reaction to the metal or polyethylene or cement. Um, and I think it's fair to call this, you know, perhaps a, a bone rats two or a bone rats three. I think that a lot of people would look at this and say, I'm not so sure I'm comfortable just blowing this off. Um, but I think following it up, seeing that there's been no change over time, putting it in the setting of the known hip arthroplasty um, um, would be a reasonable thing to do. So, oh, sorry, final one. We're bringing it home. Excellent. So seem pretty confident on that. That's because you paid attention all the way through the lecture, right? So solitary loosened bone lesion in CT, I would argue it has just about every one of these features, right? So the bone's completely destroyed, a very large soft tissue component, which goes as which goes back to the idea of things look aggressive, call them aggressive, it's a bone rats for this ended up being um, from that same patient, the metastatic thyroid cancer. So that's what I have. Uh, thank you all for hanging through and we will go to questions and such. Hey, hey, David, that was a, that was a great talk. That was a very nice summary about incidental bone lesions. <clears throat> um, really enjoyed it. And thanks for summarizing a lot of the work that we did on the panel. Um, you know, that, that panel was uh, two years of work during COVID. A lot of really uh, much, much smarter people than I am will help to design that. I think you did a really good job summarizing. Um, I just want to make a couple of points um, that you already highlighted, uh, but just to kind of, you know, because we were, when we designed the, the, that, that, the, the actual um, bone rats uh, before we move on to the questions was just that, you know, bone lesions are just really hard to deal with. I, I feel like it's it's very tough. I mean, I don't want to say that, you know, mammo is easier, but or just that's it, but the bone lesions are just, there's just tons of lesions. And it's really hard to have an algorithm that it gets exactly every single lesion. And so, you know, sometimes people were saying, oh, you know, how can you just have a category that says, is it entirely consistent with fibrous dysplasia, not fine from about this and this and this? And it's because there's so many lesions that we wanted to fit that in where like these are automatically benign things. If you are positive that these are benign, then let's take care of those and that's moving with the bone rats one. And a lot of things that we, we when we designed this thing was that it, if it is a bone rats one, remember that you may never see that patient again. So you're saying mm -hmm. leave alone. I'm confident that this is benign and we don't. So, so the bone rats one, we want to make sure that we are hundred percent certain or near hundred percent that these are going to be benign. And then that goes away. The second point that you did really well talking about was bone rats four, whereas a lot of the other um, rads, you know, the, the, the higher level rads are malignancy. Um, bone is not the same thing. You know, a lot of, a lot of our bone rats four, like, like the case you show with the osteoid osteoma, that's not a malignancy, but that requires treatment. And so, so that's one thing that I think for the people on, on this, uh, you know, on the seminar um, to realize is that the bone mass four does not mean malignant. It just means that this is something that you can't leave alone. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we want to bring to an orthopedic surgeon, referring doctor um, to say that, Hey, this is worrisome that we need to treat this and that sort of thing. So that's why a lot of these things where it's sort of like you see a lesion, somebody has history of prostate cancer, automatically bone rats four. That seems like a little too much, but again, we don't want to, we don't want to miss those lesions. So you have the bone rats ones, which you're never going to see again, the bone rats four, we definitely want somebody to see it. And then the ones in the middle, you know, which is the indeterminate and then the follow up imaging, but ultimately those indeterminate lesions have to either go to bone rats one or bone rats four. Because, and I think the nice thing is that you, yeah, you, you cover the fact that there's so many different diagnoses that fall into the two and three um, that, you know, I think, you know, not to knock on BIRADS or anything, but when you're dealing with a much smaller amount of diagnoses there, um, yeah. here it's just so much bigger that you have to have something that encompasses everything. So, yeah. Um, no, thanks. Thanks. So let's move on to the chat. Mm -hmm. So um, one of our first questions is, um, 
Have you noticed any diagnoses where the Hounsfield unit measure of a sclerotic lesion hasn't well predicted benignity or malignancy? So I think they're referring to the, to the paper, yeah. five type of thing. Yeah. When I first read the paper, um, I remember being like, no, I think I've seen some pretty sclerotic Mets before. Yeah. And so I then started putting, you know, Hounsfield units on sclerotic Mets. And I think for the most part, and this is untreated Mets, I probably should have said that, sorry. Yeah. Untreated Mets, I have not... I don't think I found too many because when I saw 96% sensitivity, I was like, there's no way. I think that that's actually held up pretty well for untreated vets. I think the ones that we think of that are really sclerotic are usually treated. I don't know if you've had a different experience. Yeah, you know, I have to say, and, and actually um, there was a paper later, later out. Um, uh, I know Hillary Gardner was on that paper that 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 actually showed that there may be some nuances with, with 885. The, so the initial paper out of Mass General, where they used 885 cutoff, they found that the average bone island was about 1,200 house units. The average non-treated sclerotic mate was about 600. I've actually felt that that works pretty well. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there now I've seen cases where, like in the paper, where clearly it, the other papers where it showed that there's a little level of difference. You know, again, a lot of this thing should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, if you have a person with clear cut reason to have sclerotic mats. And you're measuring something that's seven that's that's you know 900 or 950 you know and, and again we don't want people to follow the bone rats strictly right exactly um there's a lot of leeway and then the and then the other point which i love what you did dave was that some of the lesions you could end up being a two or three and and again you know again there's just so many lesions and so right. many different types of nuances um, and we're including real, you know, malig malig the Mets, you know, malignant lesions, benign lesions. And also we're included lesions that, that are not true tumors, you know, AVN or subchondral cysts. And so that's really hard to kind of fit every, everything in. But I think, I think, um, you know, in terms of that, I think it's also held, held pretty well. Um, another question is how are you actually using bone rats at your institution and also have your referring physicians been happy with that? Yeah, so I think that the way in which we inter we incorporated ourselves is not necessarily to give a bone rads number because unlike bi rads, you know, orthopedic surgeons are like, what are you talking about? Um, but to use that as a way to kind of direct what you think the management should be. And so, you know, one of the important things that you can do in your impression is to kind of recommend what you think the next step is. And we have to be careful doing that. And so I think that where we do really good jobs as radiologists is taking a benign lesion. We know that's benign, but maybe it looks funky. And so NO, NOFs are my favorite for this, right? Because NOFs look weird, yeah. um, but we know they're benign and we know leave them alone. And so that's where you can add so much value. Well, at the same time, taking a lesion that you're just unsure about and really using all that training that, and all that experience that you've had, you know, going through this to, to really put your foot down and say, I really think we need to follow this, or I yeah. really have a concern about this. And so, yeah. no, we're not reporting a bone rads category. However, um, um, we are using this as a way to really try and be a little bit more definitive with our management recommendations. Great, great. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've we been trying to use it just because, uh, and we actually will put it in the report as a as a macros, and then we'll have a link to the paper, and we're trying to get our, our surgeons to use it, but, you know, I don't think it's really caught on as much, yeah. but hopefully, you know, well. Uh, the next question is, um, you know, in incidental bone rats, three lesions, for example, if it's sent by a general practitioner, and you decide it's a bone rats, bone rats three, um, and you recommend follow-up, do you refer that back to the GP or do you recommend it go to ortho as well? Ortho That's a great question. Um, I think that I wish we had a little bit more of an ability to track what happens with those patients after they leave, because you're right. Um, I mean, how many times do you recommend follow-up and maybe they get followed up somewhere else, maybe they don't get followed up. Um, so I, I think in a lot of cases, we have a pretty low threshold to have them see one of our orthopods just to get plugged in um, in the hopes that if they do um, move to that area where they do need a little bit more definitive diagnosis, that at least they have that outlet. So I think we have a pretty low threshold to make that recommendation. However, we try and and um, say that that our, our suspicion that this is bad is quite low. So. Yeah, no, I, and I, I think that's what we do as well. I think it's a little, it can be a little nuanced and you don't want to you don't want to step on their toes and say, hey, just because yeah. you're a practitioner, you don't know how to manage a bone lesion um, and refer. But a lot of times I find that when we have this honest discussion with them, 
you know, I'm like, you know, do you really want to manage this? You might as well send it to ortho onc and then they can kind of deal with this and do it. And they're like, oh yeah, that, that usually works out. Um, so a lot of times in my report, I'll just, I'll give recommendations and I'll say, consider, consider referral to orthopedic oncology. Consider is such a great yeah, word. I love it's such that. an underutilized yeah. word. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> so I, that's, that's, that's the, that's like the, the, exactly what I do. I'll say whatever it is and I'll say, consider blah, 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 you know, that, that sort of thing. So that's, um, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I'm just curious, how, you know, you, you've actually, I'd love, you know, you've actually looked at this in a lot of detail, probably most of most people. Have there been anything that you're like, okay, this doesn't make any sense to me? Because I'll say that we worked on this for a while, but there was a lot of debate. And some of these we know are going to change over time. You know, I don't think we're going to change the romance categories, but how the flow charts are go, um, I feel that that, could be modified over time, just like a lot of the other RADs that are going through. And so just kind of get your thought, you know, with, with, with what you've done, anything that you're like, this doesn't make sense, or this is something we should change. It's the thing you touched on earlier, which is the question that comes up multiple times with it, which is, is it entirely consistent with? Because I feel like a lot of the lesions that we see in a book, yeah, you're like, oh yeah, that's fibrous dysplasia. Oh yeah, that's whatever. But you finally get in the real world looking at a case and you're like, I think this is fibrous dysplasia. Is it entirely consistent with? I'm not so sure. So I think that that's where it comes down to is that a lot of these entities that are benign still have huge variability. I'll tell you that I showed you that subchondral yeah. cyst there, um, but I've seen a number of subchondral cysts that didn't have a neck and that maybe had a little bit of nodular enhancement to them. And you're sitting there like with your hands up, like I really hate biopsying a subchondral cyst. I really hate biopsying a subchondral fracture. Um, but you know, these are things that, and so I, I think that those are the, the, that question, which is, you know, you called out that people kind of gave you some flack for it. I yeah. think that that's probably where I've seen this be a little bit more difficult um, yeah. is trying to make sure it's consistent with those diagnoses. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that can be really hard. And, and plus we wanted to at least give, you know, people the, the ability to kind of use their MSK knowledge, but you know, in, 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 in reality, bone rounds is really designed for non MSK people or people that right. don't feel comp that aren't, right. haven't done an MSK fellowship and don't have expertise in that, that as much. And so it's sort of like for our abdominal colleagues, who see an incidental lesion and they don't know what to do with it, um, now they can have this thing. And initially we actually had a pretty simple pathway. And when we showed it to our orthopedic co our body colleagues, they were like, no, 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 we want something way more detailed because this is not that helpful. You know, that, that, that's, that, that sort of thing. It's a good reminder that this is meant for those incidental lesions, right? If you're working up a lesion, work it up, you know, like yeah. give a, give a definitive recommendation at the end of it. If you need to biopsy it, biopsy it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome. I think we have like, like one minute left. And there's one final question that is, um, it's not actually bone lesion related, but right. I think this is a very important question given um, where you are at the University of Colorado. Um, uh, I mean, yes, yeah, so I Colorado. How do you feel about Coach Primetime coming to Colorado to be the next football coach? Primetime, baby. Um, <laughs> I think we're we're looking for some we're looking for some uh, we're looking for some some improvement over the last few years. And so, hey, bring it on. It's gonna be great. Yeah. Pay well, attention. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, well, you did a great job improving our, our knowledge of incidental bone lesions, but I'm bummed. Um, all right. So, <laughs> so I think, uh, thanks everybody for, um, uh, for joining us, uh, for the, um, SSR resident education club. We look forward to you guys joining us for the, uh, for the next session. I think there might be another, uh, a slide after I stop talking to kind of, uh, highlight where our next, uh, the next date and time and the, and where it's going to be, but thanks everybody for coming along. I'd like to thank again my uh, the speaker today, Dr. Uh, Gavark, for, uh, for, 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 for his time and uh, explaining to us about incidental bone lesions. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Fill out the survey.